So let's just jump right in. We've been talking about a lot today about diversity and inclusiveness. Um, Scott just gave a great presentation about that. I'd love to hear from both of you on how you make that real at your company. Let's start with you, Susan. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, I'll just start by saying I think the diversity question is incredibly important kind of uh, for creating great products. Um, and then also, you know, for me as a woman in, in tech, it's been really hard for me not to feel like there's many counterparts um, because I see tech as this amazing force that's changing the world and is providing so many opportunities. You fast forward and that's gonna be even more so over the next five to 10 years. And the fact that we don't have women participating in that um, or a lot of other um, diverse groups I see as like an issue for tech that they're not getting the best ideas, but then also an issue for those diverse groups that they're not participating in a trend that's so important. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that there's more focus on it, on how we can fix it. And I think, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it just has to come from the top. It has to be a C-level decision, um, and you have to spend time on it. Um, it's very easy in industries like tech where there's so much pressure, there's so much competition, and everything's happening so quickly to say, you know what, I don't have time to deal with this. I'm going to focus on the launch. I'm going to focus on the product. But no, we have to do it, and it has to come from the top. Um, and then, you know, I think the other thing I'll just say is, is that, uh, you know, again, like the people at the top are the ones that are passing on power. And I've seen that, that, you know, I've been able to make and, and be in meetings, attend events, attend conferences, because there are people who are in power who have said, you know, we're going to include Susan. She's going to be this decision maker here. And we need the leaders to look at their, their you know, next generation and, um, you know, choose and, and support a diverse next generation of leaders. Mm -hmm. Jonah? Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's incredibly uh, important, not just as a, some moral imperative, but as a business imperative. And I think one of the keys is looking at it the way you would look at any other business challenge, where y you have metrics, you um, are transparent about numbers, you try to improve the numbers, you have creative solutions and think about ideas that, that could, could move the needle. Uh, I think the top-down um, uh, support of it is really important, and then also the bottom-up uh, support of it. I think you have, um, in some cases, well-meaning white executives who don't feel comfortable talking about race or don't feel talk comfortable talking a, a, about gender. Um, it, it is a, um, and that makes it even more important to have more diversity at the executive level, but it also means you have to like help the white folks and help the men uh, think through these issues and, right. and, and, uh, and learn from people sometimes who are more junior in the organization, uh, particularly because organizations often change through programs that bring people in at the entry level. And so, and so um, you can't expect those people to, to solve every diversity problem within your company, but you, they also have valuable insights. And so I think it's a, it's a complicated um, challenge. And if you treat it like a business challenge and you make progress every single uh, year and, and, and you um, bring the same creativity and analytical rigor to it as other business problems, we'll see a lot of, pro of, of progress. And we're, we're starting to see that kind of progress at BuzzFeed. And I think Hopefully, we'll see um, progress across not just tech, but also media. And, and I think when you look at the media industry, they've been much less transparent than tech, and, and much less uh, um, they've disclosed their numbers and, and, and progress much less willingly. Yeah, that's interesting. So both of you um, were there from the start at each of your companies as you've grown very quickly. I'd love to hear your thoughts about you know, how you thought about culture early on. And, as your companies grow quickly, how do you make sure that those, um, you know, those small things, the big things that really matter about culture that, that made you innovative in the first place don't go away? You want to start? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, for me, one of the things that's interesting about having been at Google from the very, very beginning, so I was um, officially 16, but I always say if I'd started like a few days earlier, I might have been in 10. Um, <laughs> Not that it really matters, but I've been there <laughs> since the beginning, and you know, you see programs evolve, you see the company evolve, and so as a big company, you know, you see people who come in and say, "Well, this is the way we do things. Like the company operates this way," and sometimes like it makes no sense. People be like, "I don't agree with it, but this is the way we do things," and 
you know, I kind of, I think just because I've seen how it evolved and like, I feel like, well, we made up all these rules along the way, like it, we, can, we can make up more, we can change, we can evolve. We can say, no, that doesn't make sense. So in general, like I've just said, look, if something doesn't make sense, like I'm not gonna, you know, we need to change it. And I think that's like very much like an owner's point of view. Like at, we used to have a goal at, at um, Google, you know, act like an owner. Like if you're an owner of the company, you see something that's not working, fix it. Um, change it because it's all of our company and you know we need to we need to be the owners I think that's very um, something I've definitely gotten from being early um, you know I think the second thing is like small teams big goals um, and as a company grows you need to keep finding the small team and the big goals right so whether it's like the core team saying the core you know core YouTube for example how are we gonna introduce a bunch of features um, have a small team work on that or something like emerging markets. We released a new app for emerging markets. That's a small team, big goal. Um, and so keep finding those opportunities to stretch. Yeah. And Jonah, when you launched BuzzFeed, did you have a clear vision for you, how you wanted the culture to operate? Yeah, I had it all mapped out from the of beginning. Of course you did. You had thoughts. The next 10 years, though, is going to be <laughs> even more. You know. right. um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot, like, like once you start getting obsessed with culture as, as, as something that's separate from the company, it shows there's probably a problem. And I think in the early days of the company, there were, there were a lot of decisions, but you weren't thinking, what is the culture I want? And, and you, it, was, it was something people were living. Um, and I think when you get bigger, you have to be a little more intentional, um, but often you can do that by showing examples of, uh, and leading by example. Um, more than you can by putting out a list of principles or, or, or things like that. At least that, that, that's been my, been my experience. Right. Um, so the ownership mentality, I think, is one thing. I, there's this book called The Founder's Mentality, which, which um, was kind of boring to read because it all seemed really obvious, but it turns out what the book is is this survey of founders of companies and, and then aggregating what they believe. So it was sort of like I was the data set, or, or I mean, it wasn't actually the data set, but it was, it was almost these things that just seemed normal to founders, that you act like an owner, you try to get rid of process, you, you um, um, try to, to, to make things, um, uh, you, you try to figure out how to make, speed things up and do things uh, more, more quickly. Um, there's you know, but just a bunch of things that I think you get, get lost in big, in big companies. Um, and so we do things like unblocking exercises where we say, have a meeting and say, what's blocking you from getting things done? And why is it, why? And, and do they make sense or are they, or are they just some historical accident um, where, we, where we add it up, we have process that doesn't, doesn't make sense. And those unblocking, do you, are those regularly scheduled meetings or how do you? Uh, I, uh, I don't know if they're regularly scheduled. I actually don't know. Yeah. I've been to a few of them. I don't know how they're scheduled. <laughs> um, but. It, it, the, the idea is like always trying to think, how can you act more like an owner? How can you move more quickly? How can you avoid unnecessary process? How can you be, have a bias towards action and towards growth? Um, and I think that you see early employees at companies, like the very early employees at BuzzFeed, they know that we made a lot of these things up as we went along. They know that we had to keep changing. They know that nothing was written in stone. And when someone new comes to the organization, it's a big, there's a lot of people, we reach a huge audience, there's a, it's more of an institution, and they come in thinking, oh, how do I have to learn how to do things? And so you see even now some early BuzzFeed employees are often great change agents because they're the ones who know, this is all made up, this is all arbitrary, we can do it in a totally different way. And people who work in normal companies and big companies, don't, they don't believe that. Like you can tell them that, you can tell them that 20 times and they're like, yeah, but you really can't, you know, HR is going to stop it or legal or, or like there's going to be some powerful VP who's going to be like, no, you can't yeah. do that. And, and like people say that, but it's not really true. Right. Um, but if you are early in a company that grew into something, you know, as big as, as, as Google and or even, you know, to, to BuzzFeed size of 1500 employees, you're like, whoa, this didn't exist a few years ago. And now it's this big thing. Why don't we make other things that, that, that don't exist? You know, why don't we create the next chapter of this? Right. I, Go I was gonna say, I think one other thing that has been really helpful for culture and keeping the communication open is having a regular meeting where uh, you're, going, you're meeting with employees. So we have like a end of the week, you know, uh, end of the week event where we go over what happened during the week, but any employee can ask you a question to the leadership. And that creates dialogue, right? So when people 
um, are asking questions or people don't like people within the organization don't understand anything it's a way for them to say hey what how come this is happening and it's a very safe environment for them to do that like the whole point is for employees to ask questions so you know we try to make it fun we go over like these are things that happened in the week or you know good and bad um, so sometimes there's, there's serious topics as well as um, you know hooray this happened type of events but then employees whatever's on their mind um, that comes out. And as a leader, you know, that's actually, I'd say, a really valuable, um, I consider a really valuable asset for me, even though it's a lot of work, because it means I always need to be able to answer the questions that employees are asking. And I need to be in touch with what's on their mind. And so if they're concerned about something, I need to, I know I'm going to get asked it, and I need to be prepared. And so, you know, I never can be more than you know, a couple days out of sync with the company. And that's a really valuable for employees and for leaders. Yeah, I, and just to add to that, I think that's so important. And having an obsession with w the frontline employee and the audience is really the key, or the customer. Right. So, so if you're, even if you're a CEO and there's many layers between you and, and someone who is doing something that touches the consumer, you need to still know that person's job and their struggles and what they're working on and how, 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 what, what, what's blocking them. And then the audience, you know, understanding them through data and through technology and through talking to them and through anecdotes and through social media and all the different ways you can know the audience uh, or the customer, that's hugely important. And I think big bureaucratic companies lose track of the fact that really the frontline employee and the customer is the key to everything. And supporting that uh, relationship is, is really what you need to stay disciplined and focused on. And in terms of employee questions, where do you guys come down on the whole idea of making sure you've set up a system so that people can ask questions anonymously. Do you feel the need to do that? I've heard you know, all the CEOs I've interviewed, some people say you simply have to have it, there's software for that. Do you guys feel the need to do that? Or, or are people pretty vocal? I mean, so we have a system internally where people can submit a question, their name is there, um, and then people can vote that question up or down. And I think, you know, rather than necessarily making it anonymous, because I think when you make it anonymous, there are other issues, like, right, like people, there's no accountability to the question, which has other risks. I think the important thing is just to make it really, really safe. And, I mean, believe me, people come out, they ask really hard questions. Um, we go to extraordinary lengths to try to always answer the question, and, and it's hard. Like, you know, I'm on stage every week, like basically doing a Q&A and they could ask me anything. And so when I don't know, I, I actually am like, just I don't know, I'll get back to you next week. Right. Um, and I, I as a leader have to be okay with that, but we plan as much as we can um, to try to make sure that we have the right answers for those employees. Right. Yeah, the reason you get conflicting answers is because they're, they, they're different and I would, like we, tr we do both and we <laughs> go back and forth between it and there's something nice about anonymous questions. Um, they're also, um, but it has to be combined with lots of other things. Like you need to have survey data. You know, you can have an honest question where there's one person who's just obsessed about some random thing that no one else cares about, and that could come up in every single meeting or every single all hands, mm -hmm. and it really doesn't matter. Or they, that could be the brave person, you know, who's asking the thing that everyone else cares about. Right. And so, uh, you know, like we had this at one of our all hands where the question about 401k matching kept coming up, where where where. And, and we didn't know, okay, these are all a lot of really young employees, and they keep, t I guess they're very worried about their retirement, and we're a startup where they get stock options, and we're growing fast, and we don't really, you know, we weren't at a stage just a couple years ago where we would really, uh, where most companies would give 401k matching. Right. But we kept having it as a question, and I didn't know, was this, was this is this just a small, like 10% of employees want this, and, right. and no one else really cares? And, how should we deploy this, this, our, our capital to give the best benefits to employees? And so we did a survey, and it turned out that people really cared about 401k matching. Right. You know, so we provided it. And, and, but there's been other times where a question comes up and you do a survey and like 2% of people actually care about it. And then you realize, okay, this is a bug in the anonymous question process right. where someone can artificially magnify an issue that really isn't an issue to most people. Yeah. And we give people other ways to give feedback anonymously. So we, um, so we, you know, we'll do a survey um, for and how people are feeling about, you know, the company, their job, their manager, et cetera, and that's anonymous. And so there are opportunities for people to give that feedback anonymously as well. Right. And as your companies grew quickly, were there moments when you started feeling like you were 
at risk of getting big company disease. I mean, just sort of little tells of like, I just walked by a meeting and I heard somebody say, Jonah thinks this, and you never said, just sort of those little moments like, we are not a small company anymore. And I That's what I consider a win when I walk by and people are like, Jonah said this, I'm like, yes, my power is growing. <laughs> But what are those little moments in your stomach? It's like, okay, I'm starting to get worried. We're starting to sound like a big company and not in a good way. No, joking aside, that is one where, you know, something I said two years ago right. becomes uh, used in a context where it no longer matters, right. right? Like there was a period where the way we were doing advertising, we never did banner ads and people would say, oh, this is because we do native advertising and native advertising is the thing we invented, you know, seven years ago and it has to be this exact way. And people's consumption of media has really changed, and so the way advertising works needs to keep changing right. if you want it to be native. Right. And so sometimes you, you, you have, um, we talk about it in terms of this behavioral um, psychology or behavioral economics concept of anchoring, where people get anchored in the past, and you want to continually do re-anchoring exercises to get them anchored in, in uh, hopefully the near future. Right. And so the, the Chad mentioned the fear of nostalgia yeah. and, and, and culture. You, you, don't, you want forward-looking employees, you want a forward-looking mission, and anchor, but, but human psychology naturally anchors people in the past. So you, you, you're so focused on hitting a goal, you hit the goal, and then you don't have a goal anymore, and you're still thinking, oh, we're doing pretty, we're doing all right, we, right. we're at this level. And so how do you stop and say, if we were starting today, right. what would our goal be? What, if we were starting today, what would we think native advertising should be? If we were starting today, how do we think media should be distributed and consumed? Super. And doing that allows you to re-anchor, hopefully, six months or a year in the future, and, and you're constantly having to pull up these anchors that, that would keep you focused on the past instead of the future. Right. What about yeah. you? How do you do? I mean, I think that for me, I, I, I see it sometimes when, um, well, I've seen it different times across our history, but, you know, if I'm talking about doing something and people show me a plan and it's like a year out, I'm just like, it, we, can, we don't have a year. Right. Um, and that's actually where I feel like you need those change agents who come in and be like, I'm sorry, but like, you're going to get it done in six months. Like, come back, tell me how it's going to get done. Or, you know, like, so something is going out the door. And so I think we as leaders need to have, you know, we, you need to change the rules. Like, you need to say, like, that's not okay. We can't have these long periods of time. Or they'll say, oh, like, the way we're structured, we can never, you know, do blah, blah, blah. So you need to understand, like, well, what's the problem? Um, and let's fix it. So... Um, you know, and sometimes it's an organizational structure. So, you know, Google has, has evolved in, in, in our structure many different ways. Um, you know, we just had the latest mm -hmm. evolution with Alphabet, um, and those have all been, um, you know, ways of, I'll say, of unblocking, like kind of to use your language here, you know, enabling someone to be an owner. And so I think that's actually, like usually, Usually when you, you get stuck, it's because you don't have the right owner, because there's someone who's not in charge. There might be like three people, and they're all dependent on each other, and no one person can do the prioritization. And, and when that usually happens, you need to look back and say, look, well, well, why is it taking a year? Why can nobody make this decision? We need to either reorganize, restructure, um, or you know, change the person. We don't have the right person in charge um, and to make this happen. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, people always talk about scaling companies, but there's also an art to scaling yourself as a leader, and both of you were there at the beginning. How have you stayed one step ahead of the company's size as a leader um, and just sort of developing your own leadership skills? How have you done it? Well, I, I've benefited tremendously from, you know, conferences where people are like, founders are so great, founder, you know, you should, you should back founders and let them stay with the company. Um, so, you, so you end up getting the benefit of the doubt from investors and from uh, the press, and, and, and most of it is totally unfair, you know, and, um, and, or, or at least self-fulfilling. Um, so that's, that's one, 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 one piece of it, is right. that there's an expectation that if you started a company that you're going to be invested in a different way, that you're gonna have a longer term uh, focus. And if you're a hired gun CEO, uh, you, you, um, you know, the focus is on put up the numbers or you'll get fired, which right. makes you risk adverse. Uh, and, and so, so uh, part of it is I, I would never have been able to scale myself and do this job if I was a hired gun CEO. Right. I've only been able to do it because I started the company and there's a sort of uh, moral authority that comes along with that and the benefit right. of the doubt. And 
Um, and then the other piece, I think, is just continually learning and being curious and trying to understand how, you know, how should this work? Um, right. And, and, uh, and uh, knowing that you learn from your failures as well and developing a kind of, of, of resilience, see? Um, not being uh, too stressed out about risk, you know, which is, I think is maybe a, a, a job requirement, you know, where you where you're able to you're you're able to love the new thing and the new entrepreneurial thing and reshaping and recreating the business. Right. What about you, Susan? Mm -hmm. Well, I think some of the things Jonah said um, really ring true for me in terms of like having to have real passion about the business that you're in, and uh, you know, for for. You have to, like, we, we spend so much of our time doing this. It becomes so much a part of us. Like, it has to be something that you care about deeply. And, um, you know, when I kind of look, like, when I first joined Google, I really, I mean, really had no skills. Um, like, when I joined 17 years ago, like, I had basically, I, the only advantage I had is, like, I knew a little bit more in some areas, because I'd gone to business school, so, like, I knew a little bit more about some areas than our founders did. Like, right. they knew a lot more about building search engine, of course, but... Like I knew about marketing and sales and like other areas that they didn't, but I didn't know very much. I just knew a little more than them. And so my, my goal like has been to learn from the people that we've brought in and like the people who have expertise. And so, you know, at the very beginning, it was really like learning from all the great leaders that Google had. Google did a good job early on of bringing in very senior people, even though we were a small company. Um, and those people had been like, let me tell you, like, you know, I've done this before, like, let's, 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 let's not make the same mistakes. Um, and, you know, Eric had been at Sun, he had been at Novell, he had, like, built companies, so he had a lot of really good advice, and I was fortunate enough to be in a lot of those meetings. And, you know, now, like, I'm also learning from the people that we hire, the people who work for me. So, we, you know, we hire industry experts. We hired um, Lior Cohen, right, who, who is, um, you know, in music. Um, we've hired Suzanne Daniels, who knows a lot about production. Like, they come from areas where they have very deep expertise in a specific area. Um, I have deep expertise in my own area, but like, we're both learning from each other. And, and as an executive in tech, I think you have to be willing to constantly admit that there are things you don't know and that you need to learn, you learn, need to learn new skills because the market around you is evolving. And so you constantly need to be willing to be open and evolving and learning. Yeah. yeah, we call that idea humble confidence, where you need to be humble that you can yeah. don't know everything because right. so you can learn new things, but then you also need to be confident you can build big things. Yeah. And it's hard to do both those at once and they're in yeah. tension with each other, but it's a attribute we look for in people on our team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do I have it? You definitely have it. That's what made me think of it. That's what made me think of it is, is uh, your answer. I was like, oh, she, you okay. should come work at BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you could work at YouTube, too. We, we're, we're, we do work together, actually, yes, in we a do. lot of different we do. ways. Yes. So we're going to uh, go to Facebook for a couple of questions. Could you just put up the slide uh, on the monitor that was up there before? I think I could do it. Thank you very much. Um, Again, from Facebook Live from Hung Nguyen, how can you both make sure that you hire the right people? What are you going to do if you later discover they are not actually the right ones? Sounds like someone had a bad experience who asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to take that one first? So how do you hire and what do you do if it doesn't work out? Yeah, I think uh, uh, hi hiring is obviously really, really challenging. Yeah. I think um, we've, we've definitely um, continue to improve and up our game and how in our hiring process. I think when we first started, it was more like, I know someone really smart who works at this other company and wants a job, and you right. kind of hire them. And actually, that works pretty well for a small startup. There's some problems with it, but um, and then as you get as you get bigger, you start to have uh, realize that you know having levels and clear titles and career paths and all those things. Uh, um, really matter, and so um, Linka Taylor, who's our chief people officer, is somewhere here, who came from Google actually, and is uh, ta taken some Googly stuff and some Buzzfeed stuff, and is is like helped us really um, up our game in this uh, in in this you know department. Um, but it's never easy for any for any company. Yeah. Do you have a favorite job interview question? Uh, I I I mean, Lazos had a crisper description of what I do enjoy doing, which is talking to them about a specific problem and saying, and just keep going, like, how would you solve this? And how, not, not a hypothetical problem, but something they've actually worked on. And right. what did you do on that? And how did, you know, right. how did it work out? And what would you do if you could try it again? And um, just like 
getting into how they think by talking about something real. Right. Um, what about the second part of the question? I mean, if somebody's not working out, like, what's the moment that you say to yourself, "We got to pull the picture here"? I mean, it's one of the it's you know it's one of the worst things in business is when you know you think someone is going to be great and it doesn't work out. And right. I honestly feel like the cliche that oh it just wasn't a good fit is actually often true. Right. You know, like often when someone doesn't work out in a company, they really are talented and they didn't have, for whatever reason, the right position or the right opportunity. Right. Um, I also find that sometimes when people are struggling at their job, it's sometimes a systemic thing. It's like they have the hardest job where, oh, your job, you're, we're really excited about you to join and help bridge the gap between these three departments and invent this new thing. And then it's like, we thought, we thought this person was amazing and actually we discovered right. that they're terrible, you know? And, and, and so, um, so, you know, I, I think when if if if, if someone is le you know leaving the company, it might be partly on them. It's partly on the company, and you should you know part ways as humanely as possible right. and think this is a this is a another person. This isn't like uh, you know staff or whatever. This is another person, and like we wished it worked out and it didn't. And yeah. and and you know, but it's it, it is a hard thing, and it's also hard for young managers. Um, who sometimes are in the situation for the first time, and that's something that requires real coaching of how do you do, how do you make tough decisions in a humane way when you've never had that experience before, and someone might even be your friend. You yeah, know, it's not, it's, it sucks. Yeah. How do you hire, Susan? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that has been most successful in our hiring has been hiring by committee. So we have a hiring committee for um, a specific role or a family, say like engineering or product management. And I think the hiring by committee, it, it, it's not, it's like usually you don't wanna do things by committee, but when I say hiring by committee, it means that there is you know, a set of say five to 10 trusted people who have reviewed all applications for this job family or all applications um, for this level of, of role. And that has like a lot of advantages, which is that um, there's, cons like A, these people are experts in the field and the resume and the people that they've hired. Um, they're also not put in this situation. You know, most managers, when they're hiring for the role that works for them, you know, they might have different incentives. They wanna fill the role as soon as possible. Um, they, you know, um, might be someone who's like a friend of theirs who's pressuring them to hire that role. So when you, when you, like, you know, and I've, for example, on, um, you know, I came from the product management part of Google. Like, I'd say I've probably reviewed most of the candidates that Google has hired for product management. So at this point, like, I have, you know, eight, almost 17, 18 years of experience of doing this right. hiring. So there's consistency across the board. And so then when someone doesn't work out, it's like, well, we all, you know, we all voted yes for this person. Right. Um, now let's find a way to fix it. And sometimes the way to fix it is to change their role. Um, try them in a different place and then say, oh, like, well, do they do better? Like, why didn't they do well here? Well, like, they actually like more collaborative experiences and here, you know, it was like, you know, they were dealing with a lot of tough personalities. Right. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think there are a variety of ways to yeah. fix it, including changing roles. And we've been sharing a lot of our favorite job interview questions. Do you have yeah. a favorite one? Um, I mean, I, I usually, like, ask them about a specific product that we have released. Um, or like a product that is neutral, like a product that they use that's not necessarily a Google product, um, but something that I know they use, and, and ask them like, well, how would you make it better? So I, I kind of get a perspective into them of like how they're thinking about the product. Can, you know, for product managers, we want them to think, always be thinking about that next generation. Um, if they can't, you know, name a single thing about how to make a product better that they use a lot, then, you know, that's like usually a good, not a good indication that's that they'll how. be a good product manager. Um, there was a period of time where I used to ask people about their email, like how do you manage your email? And I found that incredibly interesting, the variety of ways people manage their email. Um, I got insight into their organizational skill sets. Um, I actually got some good tips, like, you know, about how they manage it. You get insight into, like, how, how they work. Do they work in the morning, in the evening, nights, like, in between meetings? How do they schedule their day? So um, I, I thought that was I'm, really useful. I'm in box 23,417. Like, <laughs> what about you? Do you, do, you get, do, you get, do you actually clear out your email? No. no. So I just, I just have, um, people find this, all my email in one box. That's um, and I've never really deleted any email ever. 
And so it's a ginormous box, and then I can search on it. So if anyone's like, I sent you right. an email like three years ago, I'll be like, ooh, let's look and see. Did you <laughs> send it to me? Like, what did you say? Um, and so that's pretty useful. But it's what it's not, and then I'll star my, like my to-do list is my, I'll star them. Um, and then I follow up on that. So I tell people like, if I don't respond in a couple of days, I might never respond. Um, it might take a while, right? Because it's not right. no longer on the top, like send yeah. it to me again. But I. Yeah, I try, I try to get back to everybody. I try to clear that star list. Um, we're email right. twins. Okay. Everything is the same. Okay. Good. We. Yeah. Have, we have, that's why we're. Uh, we're merging. We have a lot in common. That's how we wound up on the panel together. All right. We have a provocative question from yeah, David Endes. Do social media companies have any responsibility to the greater good of the nation or humanity? I think we call that a leading question. Um, your thirty-second eh, answer. Nah. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't really thought about it, but <laughs> seems like seems like the answer is no. But this, this question could take us through dinner, of course. But do you have a thirty-second answer? Uh, yeah, the thirty-second answer is that absolutely, media companies always have had a special relationship to democracy and to informing the public, and that continues today. And even if the way people consume media has dramatically shifted towards social platforms, towards YouTube and Facebook and Snapchat, right. it doesn't change the fact that media organizations and the platforms have to be great partners in figuring out uh, how, how to create media for the future that informs the democratic population and, and exposes injustice and does the things that media and news has always, always done. Right. And it's critically important you know, to, to, that we catch up to the way media consumption is happening and bring those values forward so that the way people consume media is merged with those values. Yeah. How do you think about yeah. it, Susan? Yeah, I, I, I agree that I, I, would, um, I would agree with your real, with your real answer, um, not, the fir <laughs> not the first humorous um, joke one. Um, edit this so that she agrees with the humorous one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I can't believe the two of them. <laughs> um, that might not be that funny. Yeah. You're right, you're right. Scratch that, scratch that. People on the internet, forget that suggestion. Um, yeah, I think we have real, I think we, I think we have real, real responsibility and right. I think we take, we take it, we take the, we take it seriously, right, in terms of understanding how our product is, um, how it's used, the implications, and you know, I'll just say one of the challenges is that um, you can't always understand what the downstream effects are going to be of that technology and, and what that use is going to be. Um, and so, you know, part of it is making sure that um, you know, making sure that like you're willing to be changed, you're willing to be flexible, you're willing to understand it, you're willing to keep investing and in making sure that the platforms are doing the right things. And that's. I also, where I feel like it's really helpful, kind of back to some of the earlier questions you asked, not to say we have these set, these set rules. Like, you, you know, at the end of the day, like sometimes like I'll go back to my team and be like, I, I understand we have like all these policies and you just explain to me like this legal reason and this policy reason and that like historical reason, but does it make sense? Like, do you feel like we're doing the right thing? And right. so I think it's really, really important at the end of the day to kind of think about it and be like, if I was on the receiving end, um, like, how would I feel about this? Um, and do, we f do you feel proud? When you go home at night, do you feel proud that you have made the world a better place? And that has to be the guiding, the guiding star for us about making good decisions to make um, our products have a really positive impact around the world. Great, great discussion. Please join Thank me you. in thanking Susan Thank and Joan. Appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you. you. A great treat next, uh, renowned author Marcus Buckingham is going to be joining us. He is also co-head of the ADP Research Institute, so please join me in welcoming Marcus. Afternoon. Um, so Charles and Adam had actually asked me to share some thought-provoking nuggets before you go into this give and get session and noodle on it. So. And by the way, thank you, Charles, Adam, and the entire New York Times team. This has been, I don't know what you thought, but this has been a, a fascinating day, right? 